that ever existed. A primitive man, for example, living in a rock shelter on a bluff, 3,000, 4,000 years ago, might have seen an eclipse, and it would scare him. He might do rock art. He might paint what he saw on the cave wall so that it would be represented for his future generations, future people that would, would come behind him. But he would never see another one, not from that location. He would have to move far, far away in order to be able to duplicate what he had seen. And had he not been in that exact spot then, he would not have seen it. They've always been associated with bad omens, bad luck, misfortune, diseases, miscarriages of cattle, all sorts of plagues and disasters on earth. The Chinese thought it was a dragon devouring the sun. I mean, there's not any greater monster than a dragon and nothing greater in the sky than the sun. So it has to be a dragon, right? That's the only thing that can eat the sun. So we have the great, is that not the ugliest dragon? We have a dragon eating the sun. And look here, it looks like it. See that big old chomp out of it? Go back to the dragon there, see where he's got his mouth. And look at there, he's taking a bite out of the sun. So you can kind of see how that plays into effect. Well, the Chinese were pretty smart back then. They had priests slash astronomers whose job it was to predict such things. But back then, they didn't even know what an eclipse was. You're going to find out. You're going to know more than they did here in a minute. So, but they did know that it would go away. So what do we got to do? We have to convince the emperor that we know how to make this eclipse go away and run the dragon off. And lo and behold, fireworks were invented. And very shortly after that, another eclipse fell. And they thought, aha, I'm going to get a pay raise. I'm going to make the dragon go away with my fireworks. And they did. And that's chronicled in Chinese history. Let me tell you a little bit about exactly what an eclipse is. Um, this is a solar eclipse. This is what you're going to see April 8, 2024 at about 2.05 uh, your time. A miraculous sight in the sky. Now, your sky is going to be dark. It's not going to be gray. But you are going to see this cloud, this glow that's coming out from around. This is the moon. You can probably see that on here. Clearly, that's the moon blocking the sun. You can see the surface of the moon. But behind the moon, because the moon is exactly the same diameter as we see it from Earth as the sun, during this picture, it's completely blocked out all the way to the edge of the sun to where all we see are the outer gases. You're seeing the gases of the sun, the outer chromosphere. These are hot, in some cases, 10 million degree gases that are flowing out in magnetic lines from the field of the sun. A solar eclipse is basically very simple. It's simply the moon getting in the way between the earth and the sun. In this instance, I'm going to use my pointer, I think. No? There we go. We've got the moon in the middle. Now, obviously, this is not to scale. The sun is at one million miles across in diameter, huge. The moon is only 238, or I'm sorry, 2,380 miles across, but it's very, very close to the earth, 238,000 miles. So occasionally, the moon, as we all know, orbits the earth. It goes around in a path like this. Once a month, it will be back here again, but not perfectly lined up with the sun. It's that perfect alignment that allows the eclipse to happen. It might be a little too high or a little too low, and so it misses the sun during that particular full moon. Next time around, it may get closer. But once in a lifetime, it might pass directly over the sun. And that's what's happening in a solar eclipse. Just so that you understand why it starts and then goes away, the moon is moving through the sky this way, eastward, one diameter every hour. In other words, if you were sitting there looking at the moon, you had a little yardstick held at arm's length, you would see that in one hour it's moved its own size eastward. That's the progression of the moon around the Earth. So in the course of one month, it's made one complete cycle. It's that motion that creates the beginning, the partial phases, and the end of the eclipse. Not all solar eclipses are the same, however. We've got total eclipses like we're having in, in 2024 annular eclipses, and then partial. Partial is what you had here in 2017. 
The annular eclipse, I'm going to tell you what that is, we're not having that. And that's the one you really don't want to see because it's kind of gee whiz and fun, but at the same time, if you've got a choice between this and this, I'd take that any time. An annular eclipse, the moon, as it goes around the Earth, is not a perfect circle going around the Earth. It's a little bit flattened, oblate. And that means it moves a little further away sometimes, what we call apogee, and then closer to the Earth, called perigee, at some points in that orbit. So it happens that when the moon is a little further away from the Earth, its diameter, its disk, is going to appear smaller, so it doesn't completely cover the sun, and you see a ring. And that is an annular eclipse. Okay, the, 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 the basic quick version, the cliff note version, in this particular eclipse, the eclipse is going to be moving from southwest Arkansas through northeast Arkansas. It's going to come in on the state from Texas, around Texarkana. It's literally going to follow Interstate 30 up through Little Rock and on up 167. That's really kind of the path. So it knows its way. It's got a little GPS built in. Um, the shadow of the moon being cast on the Earth is moving 2,000 miles an hour. You won't realize that. It'll look, everything's going to look so serene, so beautiful and poised in the sky, just like it was an architecture, uh, archi architect put it up there. But it's moving. It's moving 2,000 miles an hour. And that shadow is 75 miles across from one side to the other. If you're inside the shadow, you have eclipse. If you're outside the shadow, you have no eclipse. This is the path of it going across Arkansas. Here it is, Mexico. A lot of people are going to Mexico because they think it's going to be better sky conditions, less chances of rain and clouds down here. Texas is looking very bad. Arkansas is looking really good as far as the forecast for cloud cover. And there you are right about there. And you notice you're off to the side a little bit. If you're on that dark line, then you live close to me. Um, we are right about there on Petty Jean, so we're, it's going right over my observatory, which was good. I mean, I, we planned it that way. <laughs> if, you, if you're over here, all this means you're still getting a total eclipse, and you're getting the intensity of an eclipse, but it's just not going to last as long. A little over, about two and a half minutes here, which is really, for almost all eclipses, that's a long eclipse. This is the longest eclipse ever on USA soil. Four, four and a half minutes up there on Pettigene and Clinton, Fairfield Bay, that, those areas. But out here, it's just a little bit shorter because you're not quite in that, along that dark line right there. It's still going to be a gorgeous eclipse, just a little bit shorter. Another way of looking at it is you're positioned right about here. This is an actual photograph of, the, of an eclipse with the Earth's shadow taken from the uh, International Space Station. The shadow is 75 miles across this way, and it's being cast by the moon, which is there, in front of the sun, which is behind it, and that little, little bit of shadow. So it's, it's sweeping across very fast, and you may have some questions about some of this, so we'll take them at the end. This is a timeline, basically. Um, the eclipse is going to start just after, I don't go, it's going to start just after noon, uh, the sun at that particular time will be almost overhead, just a little bit to the east of overhead. And I think some of you sitting closer can see that you can see the moon itself in these pictures. The moon is moving this way eastward, as I mentioned. And as you progress toward e total eclipse time, it's getting more and more eaten by the dragon. You see it disappearing. And then it happens. Two minutes right here. All this right there, you'll be frozen in time for two minutes. And then it begins to move away. And finally, about 3 o'clock, it's gone. Now, this process obviously takes, takes quite a while to take place. So if you want to watch the whole progression of it, which I really urge you to do so, you need to be out early and stay until about 3 o'clock. This is once in a lifetime. They're going to be calling most of the schools off in Arkansas so that the students can get out and enjoy this. And I think that's an excellent idea. Okay, what's going to happen? What will you experience during an eclipse? Obviously, the sky is going to get dark. For almost three minutes, it's going to appear as though it's daylight. I mean, nighttime outside. Daylight disappears. All the nocturnal animals are going to be coming out. You'll hear little frogs coming out, birds, the nighttime birds, daytime birds will go in, crickets start coming out. 
It literally feels like instant night. Again, we don't have the twilight. There's no sunset. There's no nice sky glow. It just gets dark. The animals are confused. And the, one of the, fun, the, the funnest, I almost said, one of the most fun things that you can do is to watch your pets, watch your animals. If you have a small farm or a place where you can watch barnyard animals, semi-domesticated animals are the best to watch during an eclipse because they sort of have some knowledge. I don't know how, you know, cows get dumber as they get older, but somehow they're, they're smart enough to understand, now wait a minute, something's not right here. It's supposed to be noon, but I'm, you know, it's already time to, to go to bed. No, they, they don't quite accept it, but they do. You know, chickens will go to roost, and all's well, and then two minutes later, it's instantly daylight again, and the, the rooster crows, animals get up, the, the cows get up, they think they've had nighttime. The air cools down just like it does at nighttime. You're gonna cool down about 15 degrees probably. Uh, you'll have a slight breeze that begins to blow. Even humidity increases, and you'll have dew that can form during an eclipse, unlike during the middle of the day. An interesting thing about it, because it is something that is not natural to the human mind, is there's an effect of uh, a vertigo that sets in on a lot of people, probably the majority of people. You have a sense of losing your balance, not quite being able to focus properly. Uh, you really lose all depth perception, as though you're using one eye and the other one's covered up with some yellow cellophane. Everything is just a little bit skewed in your consciousness. As far as darkness, we start out 15 minutes before totality and everything looks normal, even though the sun is almost 90% covered. And then each few minutes we look again, the sky is getting a little bit darker and darker. And then notice at two minutes, it's still fairly bright and then totality. And it is, believe me, dark. Let me go back to this picture right here. You see that right, just that tiny crescent showing of the sun behind the moon on each side? You're in full daylight right there. It's fully, I mean, it, it, it shadows on the ground. You still have daylight. You can tell something's happening. It's kind of like the partial eclipse here in 2017. You still have a sense that there's a sort of a semi-darkening, but it's not until totality that the total darkness prevails. An interesting story about the animals and, and what happens to wildlife, since they don't really know any better, is one of the eclipses, I, I believe it was in 1985, it was an annual eclipse that I went to Mississippi on the Gulf Coast and set up for. We took movies, and our, our purpose was to, uh, to study biology at that time <laughs> during the eclipse. And we were, you know, going to study frogs and crickets and birds and things like that. And we were all set up with recorders, cameras, and people. And uh, out in the middle of nowhere, it was a wilderness area uh, in swampy land very close to the Gulf of Mexico. And as soon as it got dark, and again, during an annular, it doesn't get completely dark, but it got dark enough, it still was nighttime. As soon as darkness hit, we heard the most god-awful noises out in the, all the reeds and the cane off to our, all around us. It was frightening. And it just, it was deafening, a roar. And all of a sudden flew out hundreds of peacocks, wild peacocks down in the depths of Mississippi. I didn't even know they lived down there. And so we were, what did we get to our wildlife at that time? But that's what you can kind of expect. They had no idea. They were totally confused. They knew it wasn't time to be out for, for evening. Everybody wants to know, okay, we got an eclipse coming. I need to be in the right place. We've already established that. At the right time, we've established that. What do I need to see the eclipse properly with? Look, between now and April, you're going to be flooded with spam, phone calls, you know, not for warranties, but for eclipse doodads. Everybody's going to be trying to sell you something that's going to make your experience better. You know, you're going to have resorts, retirement villages. Everybody's going to be calling you because they've got something better than the next guy. You don't need all that junk. What happened to our feed? It says, you have said enough already. <laughs> okay. That was magic, thank you. That was just like an eclipse. An eclipse of my presentation. That was the first time that's ever happened. <laughs> but anyway, you don't need all this junk. You, don't, you, you just want to enjoy it. A lawn chair, 
a good friend maybe, your family with you, a good location and some iced tea and you got it made in the middle of the day. And you need a good pair of eyes. That's your best tool. You don't even need binoculars for an eclipse. As a matter of fact, you don't want binoculars. You don't want a telescope. But this is your best tool of all, are your eyes. Now, regarding that, we have heard a lot about eye safety. And so we're going to discuss eye safety. Everybody says, don't look at the sun during an eclipse. Don't do it. You know, it's going to be the end of, end of life for you if you look at the sun during an eclipse. Well, the, 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 the true side of that is you should really never look at the sun. Okay? During an eclipse, there's no magic radiation coming out at you. I mean, the moon doesn't give off gamma rays or something that's going to pierce your eyeballs and enter your brain. That doesn't happen. It's the same old radiation you always get from the sun. It's just that you're more tempted to look at the sun if you know there's something going on up there. If someone said, look, a UFO or a Chinese, what's the, this be modern, a Chinese balloon is going across the sky, you're going to look up at and want to see it and it may, the sun may be right there. You just don't want to do that until it's safe to look in that direction. I tell people, you get more radiation from the sun laying out on a beach, you know, on your summer vacation with your eyes closed, literally, all day long than you would looking at the brief moment of solar eclipse. You're going to get the same amount of x-ray, same amount of UV, same amount of infrared, any type of radiation. There's no magic to an eclipse. And the news media really has us confused on this because people honestly believe that there's something different about the radiation during an eclipse. The best thing is just don't look at the sun, okay? It's going to be hard because we're having an eclipse, and I've already convinced you this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, so I want you to go out and look at the sun. I'm telling you right now. But you need the right equipment, and this is very simple. Eclipse glasses, we've heard, all heard this. They're very, very basic. They're very, very cheap. They're cardboard. You can't get any cheaper than that. But you don't want to wear them the whole time. You want to wear your eclipse glasses only during the partial phases, when the moon hasn't completely covered up the sun. When you get to totality, get those things off. You want to look at the sun, because you're not getting any radiation, the moon's blocking it all. So you want to enjoy the experience. If you try to look at the sun during total, totality, you're not going to see anything with eclipse glasses. You're, I mean, it's going to be like nighttime, nothing. So take the glasses off briefly during totality. Put them back on when the sun pops back out again. What kind of glasses? Well, you're, this is where a lot of fraud comes in. Again, don't, don't buy every doodad you see advertised. You want ISO, what is that, 12312-2. Uh, the, the dash 2 goes on into other numbers, but the dash 2 is the important part. Just remember that. And they'll be marked on the earpiece on one side or the other as stamped and verified as uh, eclipse safe. Now, being the skeptic that I am, oh, before I say that, let me point out here. Again, partial phases, you want those glasses on, jerk them off right here. You know, you got two minutes, look at the sun, look, 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 put them back on. It's all over with. So you, but what I was going to say about this ISO certification, that's all fine and dandy, and that's, that's what you need to look for, and please do. Just buy your Eclipse glasses from a certified distributor. Um, if you get them from Amazon, make sure it ships from Amazon, for example. If you buy it from a retailer, make sure you ask where did you get these, because there are already fakes out there. There's knockoffs, and they're not ISO protected. And you don't want to be, they'll block what you think is the sun and let you look at the sun comfortably, but you are burning your eye. So you got to be careful about that. But my question about all this and the validity of the ISO certification is I can tell you right now, I can buy a pair of knockoffs and I can take them to a printer and I can have that printed on there very easily. And that happens. So just be very, very careful. Make sure you get it from a reliable source. Okay, we talked about location. Uh, got an eclipse once in a lifetime, longest ever. Uh, you'll never forget it, all that experience. What's the big deal as far as location? Uh, it is everything, just like we were selling real estate. It means everything. You want it to turn dark. You want it to be nighttime at day. This is an actual eclipse shot. Because of the time exposure involved here, you can't see the stars, but the stars are out. I mean, you actually get to see the sky. Now, here's location, 
And this is good. We're over here. This whole zone. Jonesboro up here. We got Jacksonville down here. There, there's me comfortably behind my gate. And here's why location is so important. Would you rather see this in Lone Oak or some other surrounding place outside of the eclipse shadow or this? That's the difference. And it just makes all, I mean, look at that. What, what an outstanding difference. This is actually what you will see in Lone Oak. This is what you'll see here. And you're looking at the solar gases. You see the redness. Those are the solar flames, the prominences that are leaping out into space. That's the good stuff. And you get to see all that with your eye. Now, by the way, if you want to photograph it, the same rule applies as far as your filter on your phone or camera if you're, if you're still using a camera. You want those glasses or something over the lens to block the, the radiation and the intensity. You can literally burn your camera up uh, if, if you don't have it filtered during the partial phases. Take it off during totality and take a whole bunch of pictures bracketing. Uh, most of you know what that means on both sides of an exposure to get exactly what it is you're trying to achieve. Here's the durations across Arkansas. This is really kind of interesting because uh, you can see Petty G, we've got 4 minutes and 17 or 16 seconds. And down here in BB, you've got 2 minutes and 27 seconds. Now, 4 minutes for an eclipse is forever. You can do a lot of stuff. You can grill burgers and, I mean, and, and still enjoy the eclipse. Most eclipses around the world are about what we're getting here. So 2 minutes and 27 seconds is no slouch. That's good. So you're going to have a lot of good time, but plan ahead. If you want to take pictures, everybody wants to do that. You want to get photographs of your kids, you know, under the eclipse sky, uh, or your family, a panorama, your pets doing weird things. Plan. Make sure that you're planned for only two minutes, so you're not going to get a second chance at it. Now, this is a simulation of, of what the sky will look like over here at about, uh, what, about 152, maybe a little later than that. And there's the eclipsed sun up there. You know, it's gonna look real small. The sun is really small. It's, it's about the size of the moon. Well, it's the exact same size as the moon as we see it with our naked eye. But it always looks big and magnificent because it's so bright. Don't ever look at it, remember? But there it is, we're looking at it right now. It's gonna look tiny because we're not used to seeing the sun out in the middle of the sky where we can actually take a look at it. So it's going to look tiny. But here's a bonus that most people haven't even heard of. I stumbled across this about two months ago, and this is more fascinating to me than the eclipse. Okay, this is a, this is a, a I, I worked this up on a sky program. This is a, an all sky view as though you were a fisheye lens and you were seeing the whole sky in one snapshot. The eclipse is taking place right there with the sun and the moon in the middle. Go back to my pointer again, right there. And you'll notice a whole bunch of, you probably can't make them out from the back, but all the planets are listed. There's Pluto down there, Saturn, Mars, and so forth. Every single object in the solar system, every single object, the sun, the moon, the earth, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, comets, asteroids, every object that we know in our solar system, our neighborhood, is going to be in the sky above you or below your feet. Now that's a remarkable thing. That never happens. Everything in our, our solar neighborhood is right there from the sun to the tiniest asteroid and comet. That's a remarkable thing to have happen. So when eclipse happens, even though you won't see all the faint planets, just know that you're pulling in, you know, spiritually, the good vibrations of all that stuff in our celestial neighborhood at the same time and you're standing on Mother Earth doing it. To me, that is a phenomenal event. Now, everybody says, what are we going to do if it rains? Well, I can't control that. You know, I've got you a good eclipse coming up, but I can't control the rain. Um, and it may, but right now the, the, the chances, April 8th, we had a pretty good April 8th this year. Um, the last year was pretty good too. Now, the overall weather prospects for next year, April 8, 2024, have improved drastically. Before this came out, we were down in the low 50s, 52 to 58 percent of uh, 
clear sky probability. Now we're up into the 60s. Texas, on the other hand, is falling down. Uh, this, just to give you an idea, this entire part of Texas is booked. And by booked, I mean every hotel, motel, campground, cow field, driveway, it's booked. You can't, you can't find a place to set up. People are starting to mosey to Arkansas. So we're gonna, we're, you know, I'm looking at it positively. If it rains, if it's cloudy, you're still gonna have a nice dark sky event. You're gonna realize something happened. You've gotten a bunch of friends together, good camaraderie, and you've had a good time planning. Most people are planning on getting to their destination on a Thursday, the eclipse is on Monday, and leaving out on Tuesday because of the traffic, and the traffic is gonna be horrendous, and that's what we're gonna talk about right now. This is just one example of the 2017 eclipse. I think a lot of you have heard the horror stories on the news from all the traffic jams and the people and uh, running out of water. They had to bring the National Guard into to Nashville, to uh, Cape Girardeau, Missouri, uh, Wyoming, uh, gosh, all, all Casper, uh, trying to think of some of the other, Carbondale, Illinois, to, to, to get people fuel for their cars because they'd been in line in, on the interstate so long they had to run out of gas. They gave them a gallon of gas out of a tanker truck. Now, this is uh, the latest uh, information that I've, I've got. This is brand new. This may not make a lot of sense to you. These look like rivers, right? But it's not. All these little lines, those represent major arteries of highways in two different areas from around the, the country. That's why the lines get thinner and thinner the further out you go and get thicker and thicker toward the path of totality. You, you can tell that's the United States because that's Florida, obviously. Anyway, we're inside this circle. Right there, that big dot, that's Russellville Marlton area, okay? That dot right there is Jacksonville. That's the estimated number of people in proportion to everybody of all the 30 million people that are expecting to flock in to the eclipse path. That's what, these dots are where they're thinking they're going to go, and this is the path that they're taking. And you can kind of trace out the, the different roadways. You can see Interstate 40, for example, going into Russellville right here. Uh, this artery right here is, um, I'm assuming that this is coming in from like the Memphis area. but. Uh, and then, as you see, it progresses on into New England. Obviously, people from New England, they're not going to be tempted to come down this way. It's going to be people, but look here, all the way from the West Coast. These are people who experienced the 2017 eclipse and hadn't had enough of it yet. They want more, and that's kind of the way it'll be. This is from 2017. Casper, Wyoming, that's the day before the eclipse. People were deadlocked, could not move. They ended up watching the eclipse from the interstate highway. They stayed in their cars or in their RVs through the whole eclipse. Carbondale, Illinois, they had 30 minutes, but this was actually right, right at eclipse time. The National Guard and state troopers and all the law enforcement that they could muster got out here and cleared every one of these cars off the freeway. 30 minutes before this shot was taken, that was free, all these cars were on the freeway stopped. And this is an RV park. I mean, just look at this. Somebody's field turned into an RV park. Festivals in every town across the country. That shouldn't be an exception here. I wish there were members of your Chamber of Commerce here, but for other reasons they're not attending today. Nashville, Tennessee, one of the best examples of what you can do wrong. They thought they had it pegged. They were expecting maybe 100 to 150,000 people, new visitors. They en ended up with well over a million coming in because it was right in the middle of totality. Um, they had to close the courts. They had to shut the hospitals down except for emergencies. They sent all the kids home from school on an emergency basis. All government operations were stopped. They ran out of water. Their water tanks went dry. Sanitation black, backed up and overflowed. It was a total disaster. And it, uh, they just simply weren't prepared. Had they been prepared, they could have benefited from this just simply in the money that they could have made. Let's take a look at some of the problems that we run into. And these are the things that you as leaders and, and, and uh, certainly influencers from an educational standpoint can help assist a community in doing. These are serious issues. 
Every one of them. I've been to all these eclipses. I know exactly what's going to happen. But let's take, let's, very quickly, let's look. Where are all these people going to set up? Uh, for example, I, I'll go back to Pettyjean again. We learned this week already that the lodge and the cabins and all the campsites up there were booked two weeks ago, completely booked. The hotels in Marlton are completely booked now already. The hotels in Russellville and Conway are filling up. They're charging $800 a night for a room, non-refundable, three-night minimum. Wow. So that's what we can expect. Food availability. If you don't have your food already at hand, just you as a homeowner, you're not going to be able to get to the grocery store to get it. And if you do get there, they're probably not going to have bread, milk, and flour. You know, it's not going to be like your typical Arkansas ice storm. Water. Every major town ran out of water. Sanitation. You know, what happens if everybody flushes at the same time? Remember that year, it's been 25 years ago, about the Super Bowl, it's, it's, a, it's a joke now, about everybody went to the potty at the same time, and Super Bowl at, at, at halftime, and everybody ran out of water pressure <laughs> nationwide. Well, that actually happened, and you know, it could happen here very easily. Uh, you've got safety concerns, you've got law enforcement. Anytime you have 100,000 people, let's say, and they don't have anything to do because you as a community didn't plan a festival or have, uh, you know, a face painting or something set up for them to do with their kids, you're going to have trouble. And idle hands are the devil's workshop. You know, you've heard that. That's, that's kind of what happens. Just a place to even park. A lot of people are day trippers on eclipses. They think they're going to leave, um, let's say, Jackson, Mississippi, and come to Arkansas and see the eclipse, they're going to leave out early. I'm going to leave at 3 o'clock on Monday morning, and I'm going to be there at 9 o'clock, and I'm going to get me a place. No, you're not either. The roads are all going to be closed. That's how much traffic we're going to have. you got all these things. Medicine, uh, the pharmacies in town. You know, I'm telling every community I work with, make sure your pharmacies know the importance of being stocked up on critical medicine, like for, for uh, insulin and, and, and uh, life-saving essential medications. Gasoline. Everybody ran out of gasoline in 2017 along the eclipse path. So it's, uh, it's you need to remember these things. Uh, if you can't remember all of it, uh, I've got it posted on my website. But there's benefits. And look at these benefits. Uh, if you're ready, um, you know, it's, it, it's like the don't buy the doodads for Eclipse. You can make doodads to sell them, you know. And you can, you can make a lot of money and just get on a bandwagon and, and uh, be wealthy. Uh, and trust me, it happens. There are so many people. There's a story about in, in Hilton Head, South Carolina from 2017, a bunch of guys partnered and went in together and built a Holiday Inn Express right on the beach. They paid for the Holiday Inn Express that one week. So... There's money to be made for everybody, from government all the way to individuals. But the festival aspect, particularly right here, you've got to remember that BB and places along this corridor are right off this major thoroughfare. Easy access, easy to get on normally, easy to get off, and that's what people are going to be thinking. Where can I go to where I won't have to worry about traffic? Well, I'll just take I 167 up to BB. And, you know, we'll, that'll take care of it. If they wait till the last day, they're not going to make it. If they try to leave the day of the eclipse, they're not going to make it. So there's some fundamental rules, so be ready, main thing. But people want wide open spaces. I don't care if it's a small parking lot. I don't care if it's Main Street. If you've got wide open spaces, you can rent spots for people to park their vehicles in. Um, campsites right now in Conway County, the campsites for an RV or even for just a tent with sanitation facilities on site, porta potties, uh, they're renting from $800 a night to $1,000 a night just to park your RV there. And they're full. And that's what they're doing in Texas. And they're full. So this is not unheard of. It happens everywhere you go. So open spaces, you can make a lot of money. But I, I see a festival right there. I mean, I can just see it. All the little tents set up and funnel cakes and people having. Lots of fun and kids with balloons. Now this is taking it to the extreme. This is what can be done. This was a well-organized rancher. This guy decided five years ago, or five years before 2017, he was not going to have cows in this part of his ranch that year. So he blocked it off into rectangles. 
Every one of those rectangles is filled with RVs. And I took the time to count how many rectangles, and then I did it the best I could, counting how many RVs I could see in each rectangle. And boy, I used some real advanced math, and I multiplied them together. And I came up with the number of RVs in that campsite, and then I thought, that is not possible. And if you look over here, there's other stuff going on. Here's a big tent, circus tent. There's another one there. There's tents up here. There's tents all over here. RVs, I called the guy because I wanted to know how much did you make. And he said, his, his very words were, well, I'm not going to tell you how much I made, but I reported $3 million to the IRS. <laughs> $3 million. And that does not include all the tents selling concessions, funnel cakes, and doodads. So everybody can get a piece of the pie. You can either have total enjoyment of this solar eclipse once in a lifetime. You're never going to get another opportunity to see this. You can make money, or you can help some other people, help your community uh, do the right thing. You can make a lot of friends for the town of BB and for this institution here if you lend a helping hand and you be the guiding force to make this eclipse 100% successful for this county. Look what happened in South Carolina. Over 2 million visitors in two days, $300 million in revenue from all over the world. And these people do. They come from Japan, Australia, New Zealand. You're going to find them from everywhere. People spend money on going to eclipses. Tell them to come here. That's all I can tell you. I want you to enjoy the eclipse and be safe and pass the word and be a good mentor to all the people coming into this community. Thanks so much. I will be happy to answer any questions if anybody wants to stick around and ask a question or two or make a comment. You can tell me that it's all staged in Hollywood. We don't really have eclipses. I have a question. I'm going to start with that. So I'm also teaching physics. I'm just considering uh, having an application asking my students to calculate with what velocity an airplane would fly to double the amount of the total you know, NASA does that. They have, they have a plane, you're probably familiar with that. Uh, it's a high altitude plane that they, that they fly at, at the exact velocity. You have to, what you have to do is you have to get the plane to the location first. And then they fly the, they fly the plane exactly opposite of the motion of the moon at the speed the moon is moving. It, uh, does, it doesn't double or triple. It actually lets the airplane stand still and match the speed of the moon so he has as long as he wants to maintain it. Now, that being said, the moon is still, it's, it's eventually the angle is going to change, so he'll, he'll drop out of the shadow, but that's a good point. He can be there 10 or 12 minutes in the, in the center of the eclipse. Right, they started doing that back in the late 70s very successfully. And uh, I said that all the science on the eclipses has ended. That was about the time that, that we ended it because they made so much progress understanding the corona of the sun during those flights. We can, we, we can uh, try looking and buy an airplane in this case? Uh, yeah, right, yeah. yeah put, uh, apply for a grant for an airplane. I don't think your average airplane, I'm not sure that you'd be able to have access to the kind of plane you'd need. I think it would have to travel a little bit too fast for that. Thank you. You bet. Anyone? Okay, I do thank everyone, and uh, please go away. I hope you, you uh, go away with some, some more knowledge that you came in with and are ready to share the eclipse. Thanks so much. <laughs>